So very thankful to see everyone this evening for the opportunity to come together that we can study God's Word. And I trust that we will open our Bibles and open our hearts and minds and receive God's Word with meekness, knowing that it is able to save our souls. I appreciate so much the brethren that filled in last Sunday for Lee doing the morning sermon for Philip, not Philip, but <laughs> uh, for Stephen doing the evening uh, lesson and then for Shane taking care of the Bible class for me. Uh, I'm sorry for all of the absence that I'm going to be seemingly involved in. Uh, one already this month, and of course next Lord's Day. And I do appreciate all of the good brethren that have a willingness and a desire and the ability to be able to, to fill in for me when times require me to be away. I go tomorrow for my pre-admission that I went to for the 1st of August and got turned down. So I hope I don't get turned down tomorrow. But um, I'll be two weeks away from the surgery, but of course we'll, Lord willing, planning to go be with uh, Deanna in the very uh, difficult surgery that she'll be having to experience this coming Friday. So I do, do solicit your prayers on her behalf. In our study this evening, we looked at how should we treat those who have been unfaithful. How do I reach out to them? How do I show that I care about them? How can I be, make sure that I'm not encouraging them in their sin? And does not to keep company mean that I'm to avoid them when I see them in public? These are just a few of no doubt the many questions that come into our minds when it is that we have to do that dreadful job of having to withdraw from those that are unfaithful because of their unwillingness to repent of their sins. When it comes to how to treat the unfaithful, there are generally two extremes. One is treat them like nothing's wrong. Just treat them as before they became unfaithful. That's one extreme. The other extreme is to treat them like they have some kind of a disease and completely avoid, completely ignore those individuals. When withdrawing fails, we have to understand that it's often because members disregard God's instructions on how to treat those that have been disciplined. And let's not forget Withdrawing, discipline, whichever word you want to use, is to save the error. That's the one thing that we must always keep in our minds and in our thoughts. It's to save them. And so the question is, what is the best for the errand? How do the errand, how the errand are treated after that they've been withdrawn from? and certainly make a world of difference as to whether or not they will renew themselves unto the Lord. I want us to look at two primary passages in our study this evening. So if you will, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And the other one that we will be looking at is 2 Thessalonians 3. But first let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's read first to start. Verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. We see in this first verse the problem. The problem is that there is a fornicator among them, a fornicator in their midst, in the church at Corinth. It is something that has been well reported. It is pinpointed to be a matter involving fornication. The fornication in particular is that a man has his father's wife and the action that is being engaged in is something that is not even heard of 
among the Gentiles. Now let's look at verse 2. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So here is what has failed to take place. There has been a failure to not deal with this fornicator as he ought to be dealt with. And so instead, the church is puffed up. They had not mourned, and they had not taken this fornicator away. Then let's look at verse 3 and read through the remainder of the chapter. For verily as absent in body, that present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan, for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. Even for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must you needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that it was out? Do not you judge them that it was in, but them that it was out, God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. What we see in these verses that we've read are the instructions that the apostle has given by inspiration to put away this fornicator. Certainly, as verse 3 and 4 talks about, there's been no question about what should be done. Paul said, I have judged already concerning him in this matter. It is something that the whole church was to do. And that was stated in verse 4, and he says, when you are gathered together. It was for the purpose, we see the purpose for putting him away. There in verse 5 through 8 that the spirit may be saved, that the church can be purged of the leaven. We see that in verses 9 through 11, they were not to keep company with him. In verses 12 and the first part of verse 13, we are to judge those within the church. And the result being that's the case, put away then the wicked person. Now let's turn our attention to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. <clears throat> let's begin looking at verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. So here we see the command. The command is to withdraw from the disorderly. They were to do it in the name of Christ, and that word withdraw is a, means a word that means to pull back, to abstain. It means to avoid. It's a word that means remove. And it is directed toward those that walk disorderly. And that continues to walk disorderly. The word walks is the indicator that it's continuing in the disorderly conduct. Let's look at verse 7. 
For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be charitable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should ye. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. We see what the sin was here that Paul is addressing in the church at Thessalonica. The sin seems to be due to a misunderstanding. Paul talked a lot about it in the first letter to the Thessalonians concerning the second coming of Christ. And it appears in the things that Paul says in the second letter that some of these Thessalonians had drew the conclusion that what Paul was saying about the second coming was that it was going to occur in their lifetime. And so in the second letter, Paul is having to correct that misunderstanding. And then all we do is go back to chapter 2, and we see that to be the case. Verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a fall on the way first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So Paul sets it straight that, no, we're not saying that Christ is going to come in your lifetime. There has to come a falling away first. And it would seem that because it would follow, if many people had that in their mind, that the Lord was coming again, they would begin to vacate the things of this life and work. working would be one of them. And so we see that obviously, the things that were now happening in Thessalonica was that there was laziness and there were those that were being busybodies as a result of their laziness, not having, not working. Then let's look at verse 13. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So here again, we see the instructions given in these verses. They're not to keep company with such an individual. They're to admonish him. Verse 13, they're not to grow weary and well-doing. They're to note that person. They're not to keep company with that person. They're not, though, however, to treat him as an enemy. But instead, they were to treat him as a brother. When it comes to how to treat the unfaithful, the question, who should withdraw from the unfaithful, is a very important question. And that question is answered when we understand that it is to be the whole church. That's what we saw in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4 that we read just a moment ago. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this being gathered together signifies the church having come together, which is the definition of the local church assembled. We see it in 1 Corinthians 11. We see it in 1 Corinthians 14. We see it here in the matter of withdrawing in 1 Corinthians 5. We also see it in the matter when Paul writes the second letter, and it seems that the church at Corinth has carried out the commands that he's given here in regards to this fornicator. In 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, he says, This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient. 
for such a man. So clearly it is the whole church that it is to withdraw from the unfaithful. Not just the elders, not just the deacons, not just the men of the congregation, not just what we might call the core members, and that is those members that can always be counted on to be at the services every time the church assembles. Not just them, but the entire church. The whole church is to withdraw from the unfaithful. And since the whole church is expected to agree and to support the discipline, then truly they are entitled to know the facts and the matter. And think of the effort. If every member was to work toward restoring the error. You know, we're commanded in Galatians 6 and verse 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So just imagine the effect it would have if every member was to work in the effort of trying to restore those that have become unfaithful. Therefore, all, every member, is to back, they are to support, and they are to uphold the withdrawal. You know, often there is an element, and sometimes it is sizable. There can be several members that will not support withdrawing. And if that's the case, it only renders the action to be ineffective. You know, when one doesn't support the church and the discipline that it puts upon certain individuals, Think about this. If a person doesn't support the actions of withdrawing from an unfaithful member, that person does not respect the authority of Christ. Because that was what we see in both 1 Corinthians 5 and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It was something that Paul said is to be done in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've always talked about what it means when the word in the name of Christ is used. It's something that's done with his authority. So when a person does not render support, their support in the discipline of unfaithful members, they simply just do not respect the authority of Christ. And that person does not really love the erring individual is a should. As we said a moment ago, it's for the saving of their soul. It's that their spirit may be saved in the day of judgment. So a person that does not support discipline on the part of the church really does not love the person in error as they ought to. And a person that doesn't support church discipline is a person that's really not interested in keeping the church pure. Because that was one of the things that was emphasized in 1 Corinthians 5, as a matter of why discipline is to be done. Not just only for the saving of the soul of the person that's in error, but it's for the sake of the church. And so a person that doesn't support church discipline, he's not interested in keeping the church pure. He's not interested in maintaining the respect of the world either. You know, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, when death came upon Ananias, great fear came upon all of the people, not just the disciples, but all of those that were around and involved and heard of these things. So again, a person that doesn't support church discipline, he is not interested in maintaining the respect the that the church needs and ought to have in the eyes of the world. And then two, when a person does not support the discipline of the church, then they must feel that other members of the church really just don't need an example 
or a warning. And the point is, since withdrawing is the action of the whole church, how each member treats that person is very important. So how should we treat the unfaithful? And I think the number of principles that we are involved and that we read about. First of all, one principle of how that we're to treat the unfaithful is to demonstrate that we're trying to save them. Is that not what we read in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17? Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But then it goes on and says, if you will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. So we're to demonstrate, we see here that when we go to that brother and we tell him his fault, we're doing this trying to save him. And then still, if that is not the case, that he does not repent of his error, then we're to treat him, as he says in verse 17, as a heathen and a publican. Now what that means is that we need to treat him as one living a wicked life. That's what it means. That's what it amounts to when you consider the manner in which a heathen or a publican, who is, of course, a tax collector, was to be treated. You treat him as one that's living a wicked life. You don't do anything to show approval of him. And you let them know that they're viewed in the same class as one who is outside of the family of God outside of the family of God because of the things that they have done that have contributed to God's will. Another principle is you avoid them. Romans 16 and verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Now, it cannot mean that we literally, totally avoid them. That is, we don't even speak to them. Because we've read those verses of Scripture in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 15 that we're not to count him as an enemy, but we're to admonish him as a brother. So no, it's not meaning that we're to just totally avoid, not even to speak to such an individual, because we are to admonish them. It means that we are to turn aside. That's what Vincent in his word studies says concerning this word to avoid. It's really the same word that we find in Romans 3 and verse 12. And there we read that they have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And the word we see also in 1 Peter, in chapter 3 and verse 11, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. So here's the words that we have in Romans 16, 17 concerning avoid them as we see it being used in other verses of Scripture. In fact, the American Standard Version says turn away from them. Not to associate with them not to socialize with them. So that's a principle that we need to keep in mind when it comes to how should we treat the unfaithful. Another principle is not to associate. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, or as the King James says, fornicators. And then in verse 11 he says, but now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. 
who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. And then there's that passage in 2 Thessalonians 3.14, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. That word company, not keep company, it means to mix up together. And again, that's just where we get our word socialized from. Thayer gives that definition, to mix up together. So it's not to socialize, and it's even very specifically, plainly stated in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, that that involves matters of eating together, not even to eat. And what's the purpose of it all? The purpose of it all, we read down 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 14, is to cause them to be ashamed. Another principle involved in the answering of how should we treat the unfaithful. We don't treat them as an enemy, but we admonish them as a brother. 2 Thessalonians 3.15. What this means is they're not to be forgotten. Because they've been withdrawn from, they're not to be forgotten. They're not to be treated as some unwanted relative. They're not to be viewed as a bitter enemy, but as a brother, a brother in error that we love and that we care about. Another principle and how to treat the unfaithful is to treat them with love. In 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 8, therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. This is, as I said, the second letter where it's obvious that the Corinthians had went about doing what Paul had urged them to do in the first letter in the fifth chapter concerning the fornicator. And so love is to be a part of. This word agape that I'm sure you've heard of many times before, it's a word that means to seek the best for them. And what's the best for a person that is unfaithful? What is the best for a person that is in sin? To save their soul. That's what the best interest that we can possibly have in such individual is to save them, to have them forgiven of their sins, treat them in a way that shows that we love and that we care about them. In fact, I found it interesting that on this verse, 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 8, here's what W.E. Vine in his dictionary says. Christian love, whether exercised toward the brethren or toward men generally, is not an impulse from the feelings. It does not always run with the natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. Love seeks the welfare of all. And that's the kind of love that this word agape has to do with. Another principle is to be kind. In Ephesians 4 and verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. On this verse, a statement in the pulpit commentary says, sweet, amiable in disposition, subduing all that is harsh and hasty, encouraging all that is gentle and good. You know, when it comes to dealing with the Aaron, that doesn't mean that we are to be ugly. It doesn't mean that we're to be harsh. We can rebuke as we must but we can still be kind in our rebuke. And another principle that we must always keep in mind 
and trying to restore the earth is that that's what we're seeking to do. We're seeking to restore, bring back. In Galatians 6 and verse 1, we read this verse a moment ago. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a trespass, ye to the spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. This seeking to restore, that's something that needs to take place before a person is withdrawn from, and it needs to be taking place even after they've been withdrawn from. So it's before an action, before and after the action. We need to continue to look for, and we need to use the opportunities that are available to talk to this person about their souls. And one, you know, if we should feel that not enough has been done, then let's do more ourselves. Let's don't put it off on someone else, to, let's make it our responsibility. Make it our duty, our job to do. Another principle is to demonstrate a willingness to forgive. And that, I think, is implied most certainly in the passage that we read concerning the brother that goes to the brother to point out a a fault within it in Matthew 18. It's certainly what we see the church at Corinth did in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It was all in willingness to restore. See, we don't need to have this error. We don't need to rebuke with this attitude that, well, I'm glad I have a reason to condemn you. No. That, that not at all. That doesn't demonstrate a willingness to forgive. It's for a person and go at a person with that attitude. Now, we've looked at some principles. In fact, about nine of them. And we examine these principles. I hope well enough for us to understand. What I want us to do now is to make some application of these principles. And here they are listed in the box. So I want to have some questions that we need to think about and give answers to. And in regards to these principles that we've seen and how that we're to treat the unfaithful, in each and everything that I say and each and everything that I do in regards to this person that has been withdrawn from, I need to say that does my action violate any of these principles. It's what I'm about to say, it's what I'm about to do to this person. Am I violating any of these principles that I need to be aware of when I come to ask the question, how are we to treat the unfaithful? And I need to ask myself, do I, do what I want to do harmonize with these principles? And that is to restore, to have a soul that's in sin, to be saved, forgiven of their sin. So let's pose some situations. We run into one from whom we would not. We run into him at the grocery store. We run into him at the mall. Run into him anywhere, but we run into them. Should I seek to avoid them? Should I? Should I refuse to speak to them? Should I try not to let them see me? Is that the way I am to treat someone that is unfaithful, someone that has been withdrawn from? What about this situation? I'm invited to a social setting where one who has been disciplined is, is in attendance or there. Do I stay so as to not hurt somebody's feelings? Or do I leave? What do we do in a situation like that? 
Here's another situation. What if the one from whom that we've withdrawn shows up at services, shows up here at the building? Do I ask them to leave? Do I show them that they're not welcome? Do I welcome them and do I tell them that I'm glad they're here? What do we do when we apply these principles that we've looked at? Another situation. What if I have business dealings with those that have been disciplined? Say he is a merchant and he owns a store that I frequently go to. Or maybe they're a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant. Maybe they're a serviceman. Maybe they repair automobiles or washers or dryers or whatever. Or maybe they're just a sales clerk. What's the answer to this? I know what my answer is. I can't conscientiously continue to support them in these things to associate with them in these things. If I'm not to associate with them socially, then I don't think it's business as usual, even in these areas. But, that, but that's my personal conscience in the matter. And that, that may disagree with some of you, but that's, that's my conscience. I can't socialize with them, so it cannot be business as usual either. Then, one other situation. Suppose the disciplined person repents. And now I am with them in a social setting. How should I treat them? Do I try to avoid them to show disgust for their sin, even though they've repented of it? Do I speak and be kind, or do I try to distance myself in that situation? Or do I seek to give them a wholehearted embrace? How should we treat the unfaithful? Let us ever be mindful of these principles and make the application of them whenever we have that opportunity and let us do everything we can to make the opportunities happen that we can reprove, rebuke, but admonish in the hopes of saving their souls. But at the same time, be careful about our socializing with them and in any way giving them comfort in their sin, any endorsement in the lives that they're living. So this is what we've been studying in our lesson tonight, how to treat the unfaithful. Who should we withdraw from, and how should we treat those that have been withdrawn from? Tonight, if there are those in the audience that have not obeyed the gospel, let's not leave this opportunity to allow you the opportunity, to allow you the chance to make that decision, and you will. You will make that decision, either intentionally or unintentionally. If you decide not to even think about it, you've made a decision. It's something that you've done. So tonight, if you're here and you need to obey the gospel, you know that when Jesus comes again, that he's coming in flame and fire, taking vengeance, on those that know not God. I know you know God, but he also says those that have obeyed not the gospel. So it takes both in order for us to escape the vengeance. The vengeance that he's rightful to take because he came to this world and he suffered, he bled, he died for you, for me. And if we're going to live our lives on this earth and take advantage of all of the blessings that he gives us in a, of a material way, 
and never one time make our commitment to him. Deny ourselves in order to do his will. No wonder it's going to be in flame and fire that he's going to take vengeance. He's a just God. He's a righteous God. But he is a God that takes vengeance upon those that do not do his will. You say, well, that scares me. Well, it needs to. If you're here and you've not obeyed the gospel, you need to be scared. But that doesn't need to be the sole motivating factor, but it needs to be a part of it. Fear is a great motivator. But let it not be the only motivator. Let it be for the understanding that you have of the love that God has for you. And what Jesus was willing to do for you. So let it be for a number of reasons that motivate you. Let it be for the purpose that you want to have the hope of heaven when this life is over. There's so many things that needs to motivate a person that has not obeyed the gospel. And tonight is an opportunity. We're willing to assist you to that end. And if you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, but yet there's sin in your life, you're unfaithful, you've not attended as you ought to, there's things in your life, there's things that, that you have done that you know that are contrary to God's will, there's things that you fail to do that you know God would have had you to do. It's all sin. And it all separates. And we need to have sin forgiven. And we do when we repent, when we confess our sins. We have that assurance that God is faithful. He's just. To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's be like Simon and pray that those things in our lives, in our hearts, in our actions that we've done that are contrary to God's will will be forgiven us. And now is the time and opportunity that you know you have. And it may be the only one. So take advantage of it now. While together we stand the same.